Okay, this video is a book review. The name of the book is Oxygen by Nick Lane, PhD. Here's the book, Nick Lane, Oxygen. It was written probably in around 2002. Um, he's a PhD from England. He's an evolutionary biochemist. He's kind of like the darling priest of the atheist Darwin crowd. Um, Darwinism is sort of the excuse being used to uh, decrease the population size around the world, by the way, in case you didn't know that. It's the religion of communism. Okay, but anyways, why do I still like this guy? Because he's actually pretty smart and he's actually trying to really understand things. And um, he does a good job of discussing biochemistry with regard to Krebs cycle and the uh, free radicals produced by, you know, superoxide anions and whatnot. So I found that interesting. And his main perspective is trying to understand things from an origin of life, evolution of the world perspective. Okay, so he'll go back to what he perceives as the beginning of time with the hydrogen vents coming up through the bottom of the ocean. And he thinks that was a mechanism to get hydrogen to mix with uh, CO2. Um, so he also has some good metaphors and he spends a lot of time thinking about these things. My favorite part of the book was when he talks about mitochondria, uh, free radical reactions in mitochondria and the way that the origin of life, he perceives it to have been anaerobic bacteria that ran Krebs cycle in reverse and use it for synthesis. Instead of pulling off CO2, you know, carbon dioxide, they were adding CO2s to make molecules for synthesis. Uh, so the opposite of the way humans run it today. By the way, I showed you a picture here. So this is Nick Lane right here. Um, this right here is James Tour, And they're sort of like, He's sort of the big honcho of the sort of atheist evolutionary view of the origin of life. And James Tour is sort of the, you know, the, the genius of the intelligent design uh, perspective on the origin of life. By, by the way, I myself believe in intelligent design. I majored in evolutionary biology at Stanford, was an A-plus student, etc. Uh, because the more you study this stuff, the more it's like it has to be God. And here's one thing that James Tour says. No one has shown any way possible to make the chiral carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids, or nucleic acids in a prebiotically relevant manner. Biosynthesis is constrained. It's chiral. That means, you know, for example, of an amino acid, you have the L version, the levo version, okay? And that's relevant because molecules have to be made correctly or they don't function in biological systems. Okay, so anyway, we're not going to get into that right now. Um, let's see what else. I liked his metaphor. For example, I gave a lecture recently on enzyme uh, active site mechanisms with regard to like for example he described the electrostatic gradient of positive charges on superoxide dismutase leading into the active site as being like the guiding lights on a runway to help a plane land and see the uh, airstrip at night. Um, his previous book well, was actually it's a more recent book the one called Transformer went into even more detail about uh, Krebs cycle which I like because I'm very interested in Krebs cycle. If you want to understand cancer you have to be aware of the fact that Krebs cycle runs backward in cancer which makes sense that in the sense because cancer is very much like a human eukaryote cell that has gone backwards in time that's transformed itself into an anaerobic bacteria. So to have an understanding of its metabolism that's good to study. Okay, You, you sort of need that if you're going to make sense out of it. Uh, let's see, what else? He said, God has an inordinate fondness of carboxylic acids. Yeah, if you look at the biochemistry of human metabolism from glycolysis through Krebs cycle, you're primarily working with carboxylic acids. Okay, that's that basic chemistry of carboxylic acids. Uh, and then here's what he says. He says, you know, Krebs cycle is really pulling hydrogens off of carbon substrates, the carboxylic acids. Originally from glucose, they can also be fed in there from uh, amino acids or from the breakdown of fats, but primarily from glucose. CO2 is excreted a waste product. But here's what I think is interesting. He didn't even say this, but it's obvious. Hydrogen is pulled off these molecules, and then mitochondria splits the atom. You know, humans think it's such a big deal to split the atom. It's been done by life for billions of years. All right, so what happens? The hydrogen is split into a proton, usually written as H+, and an electron. The H plus protons are pumped into the intermembranous space. I'll show you pictures of this in a moment, but just to have the vocabulary out there uh, before I show you the pictures. Okay, H plus is pumped into intermembranous space. You build up an electrical gradient. And the uni unique thing about life is this electrical gradient. Yeah, life runs on membrane electrical gradients. Okay, the bacteria itself will run a gradient uh, on its external plasma membrane, on its plasma membrane 
adjacent to the cytoplasm, whereas in humans we've got mitochondria, so we run it on the, the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, electrons run down the electron transport chain of the inner mitochondrial membrane, and then a hydrogen is brought back in from the intermembranous space into the mitochondrial matrix, and that runs through ATP synthase, complex number five, if you will, and it's like a mill water wheel, the energy of, of harvesting the gradient, so to speak, letting the H plus come back along its desired direction is used to add a phosphate to ADP to make ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, the energy currency of the cell. It's like a $20 bill equivalent in a cell. So what was this book good about? This book was very good on oxidative stress. This guy's been studying it for decades and he thinks about it every day. So he knows mitochondria and oxidative stress quite well. And he gives a beautiful description of it. He says, just like bacteria in nature will hide under a pile of dead cells. In a sense, we hide under our skin, if you will, a bunch of dead cells uh, from the sun's ultraviolet radiation, for example. Um, the main thing produced in the mitochondria are these superoxide anions. They have an unpaired electron in the outer orbital, just making them a free radical. It's a superoxide anion. And we always produce these. It's estimated that we produce about 1% of our uh, electrons end up going into a superoxide anion free radical under normal conditions. He says when we exercise, it's been estimated that it's probably about 10%. But that exercise also builds a hardiness into the body, you know, almost like a hormesis effect, whereby we're then thus stronger when we sort of ramp up, upregulate our antioxidant systems. Um, good discussions about hydrogen peroxide, um, hydroxyl radicals, you know, which are mostly made when you start having other problems, like if you have excess free iron around. He really emphasized, as has Douglas Kell and other experts on the subject, excess free iron is a big deal and remember men in western countries after their you know the early 20s when they're done growing they start becoming iron overloaded progressively and women do when they're postmenopausal that's why you want to avoid high iron foods it's not good unless unless you're low in this stuff like a menstruating woman might be low for example um good discussions of superoxide dismutase the enzyme for you know, sort of neutralizing uh, superoxide, okay? This will make it into H2O2, and then catalase will then take the H2O2 and make it into um, to water. The thing about it is that H2O2 is usually not a big deal except when iron's present because then you can run the the, uh, the Fenton reaction. And I, I've given lectures on oxidative stress and uh, talking about these other things at length, and um, there's going to be something interesting coming out of this in a moment about diabetes. Ferritin is the binding protein to store iron inside of cells. Um, they also have transferrin to carry it in the blood. Ceruloplasm carries copper in the blood. Um, he has a good discussion of free radical reactions. And basically, two free radicals will keep reacting. Free radicals will keep reacting until they bump into another free radical or into, uh, free radical or into an antioxidant like vitamin C. Okay, um, I'll show you a couple pictures now. And actually, let me just briefly mention a few other things from the book here that I thought were good. Basically, in order to... Um, convert oxygen into water, you have to add four electrons to it. So the first time you add one electron, you get a superoxide anion. This is relevant. This is, this is the basics of mitochondrial biochemistry. If you add two electrons to water and you throw a hydrogen on there, you're going to end up H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, three electrons is trouble. That's when you have hydroxyl radicals. Four electrons added to oxygen, and then you get water, which is you know the desirable end result. Um, so that comes up a lot. Uh, let's see, what else was interesting here? One last thing I think I mentioned to you. Oh, he talks about people who can have a mitochondrial enzyme defect and they'll end up with diabetes. And that's kind of interesting because it goes with what we talked about, the Brownlee paper and the Shellman papers, that insulin resistance is caused primarily by high-fat diet leading to a problem with the mitochondria and reversal, like let's say at the level of coenzyme Q and complex 3. So you don't want to be doing that. But all, remember, I gave lecture on mitochondrial inhibitors. All these mitochondrial inhibitors, if you decrease mitochondrial function, you're going to predispose these patients to insulin resistance and diabetes. Okay, so that's another reason why you want to avoid all those mitochondrial inhibitors. Okay, um, he doesn't really know that much about diet. Almost none of these PhDs ever do. Uh, but let me show you a couple slides now about some things that are a little bit interesting. Okay, here's the mitochondrial anatomy, the, the real basics. There's an outer mitochondrial membrane right here. There's the intermembranous space, usually it's abbreviated IMS. Outer mitochondrial membrane is usually abbreviated OMM. The green lining here is the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
and that's usually abbreviated IMM, inner mitochondrial membrane. Then in the center of the mitochondria, that's called the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, and so the intermembranous space is where the protons are pumped. This inner mitochondrial membrane is where electron transport uh, chain occurs. And the matrix in the center in here, the mitochondrial matrix, that's where Krebs cycle runs. Okay, so you start out with glucose, it's taken into the cell, it's phosphorylated, it runs through the initial pathway called glycolysis. The end product is pyruvate, and then pyruvate enters the mitochondria, it's decarboxylated, CO2 is taken off, the enzyme is pyruvate dehydrogenase. And for our purposes, the most important thing at this point is that two hydrogens are also stripped off, okay? And then the atom is split. The protons are going to be pumped into the intermembranous space like we spoke about a moment ago. And then the two electrons, so a hydrogen molecule, you can split it into a proton and an electron. And then the electrons run down the electron transport chain. Okay, the decarboxylation converts the three carbon pyruvate into the two carbon acetyl CoA. And then it combines with oxaloacetate, a four carbon molecule, to make a six carbon molecule. And that's going to be citrate, um, the tricarboxylic acid molecule. Okay. And then the rest of the stuff there was just Krebs cycle. This would be a typical example of like how I would memorize a biochemical cycle when I was in med school. I would look at the first letter of all the, of all the substrates, the reactants there, and the products. You know, the substrate of one reaction is you know, the product here, and it's a substrate for the next reaction. Okay, so basically TIA means ant in Spanish, and I'll remember tricarboxylic acid, which is citrate, isocitrate, and then the A for alpha ketoglutarate. You can use McDougall's book, Start Solution, SS, succinyl-CoA, succinate, okay, and then FM, like an FM radio. So I would imagine my aunt walking into the room with McDougall's book in her hand, Start Solution, she puts on an FM radio, um, turns it on, okay, and that, so FM, fumarate malate, and then the O is for oxaloacetate, okay? And then as we said before, the 4-carbon oxaloacetate combines with acetyl-CoA to make citrate, the tricarboxylic acid, the T at the beginning, and the cycle goes in a circle. And again, it runs in this direction for catabolism, for breakdown of the molecules to generate energy, and the CO2 is excreted as a waste product. The real desirable product is getting these, pulling these hydrogens off and splitting the atom, if you will, into the protons and the electrons, okay? And then these are used to generate energy. So it's kind of like, you know, just burning up carbon material in a fire, except what human metabolism does is it breaks it down into a bunch of small steps because these small steps are controllable. The energy is released gradually in small steps that can be converted into ATP by us, okay? And here's an example of the intermitochondrial membrane. The electrons are passed down like a fireman bucket brigade from weak uh, grabbers of electrons to progressively stronger grabbers of electrons and the oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor. It has a very high what is called electronegativity, meaning desire to grab electrons. It's next only to fluoride is the most powerful grabbers of electrons. And then the oxygen, it's going to get four electrons and then it's converted into H2O. The big enzyme pumping stations are called complexes. Complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, complex 4 and then complex 5, if you will. But basically, first one pumps a proton. Complex 2 is actually part of Krebs cycle as well, and it doesn't pump a proton. Complex 3 and complex 4 also pump protons, okay? Coenzyme Q is the one that's partially inhibited by statins. Um, cytochrome C is the one that gets involved in apoptosis when the mitochondrial is uh, severely damaged and can't run at all or for other reasons that the cell can't function. But the thing you need to know is electrons are passed down this gradient and they end up, four of them, going to O2 to make water, H2O, okay? Okay, here's just another way to draw it, showing that uh, dropping off a coenzyme Q, it's a bit of a bottleneck. About 1% of electrons under normal conditions hit, join with oxygen in the matrix, become superoxide anions. Then SOD, superoxide dismutase, uh, will convert that to hydrogen peroxide. I, you know, I forgot to draw the H2O2 in here. Um, and then catalase, or there's other albums, thyroid reductions, for example, will convert the hydrogen peroxide, which should be right here, into H2O and oxygen, okay? And that's normal conditions. That happens all day long in every cell in your body. Okay, now here's showing when you have an excessive amount of the superoxide anions um, and you have a lot of free iron available, very bad thing, 
you can take some of this H2O2 and convert it into hydroxyl radicals and that can damage the membrane through, three, through free radical reactions like lipid peroxidation. In addition, if you got some nitric oxide in the mitochondrial matrix, which you often do, and you got these uh, superoxide anions in excessive amounts floating around free, they can combine with the nitric oxide and produce peroxynitrite. And that also is a very aggressive uh, molecule that can damage the intermitochondrial membrane with lipid peroxidation. H2O2 is a little bit dangerous in and of itself because it has a relatively long half-life and it can diffuse into other uh, locations. But anyways, this is sort of the oxidative stress stuff. I talked about this in other lectures. Just to give you an idea that, you know, this is just not, this is not just Nicholas Lane. This is well-known stuff that uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle, same thing as Krebs cycle, will reverse directions in certain situations, like in some cancers. Here it is happening in melanomas, okay? I kind of wonder if melanoma is at increased risk from excessive EMF and that, you know, you don't want to be living in the top floor of, of an apartment building with a big uh, telephone pole on the roof where you get an EMF a lot. Okay, here is normal Krebs cycle running in the standard direction, clockwise direction for generating energy. And then here's an example of, the, you know, from that same paper about melanoma of Krebs cycle running backwards for biosynthesis. Cancer is all about biosynthesis because cancer is behaving like an anaerobic bacteria. It just wants to replicate itself as fast as it can. In order to replicate itself fast, it has to double itself, double all its contents. Um, you think about a human cell, there's 3.3 billion, B as in billion, base pairs of DNA. That's a lot of DNA that has to be made, plus all those plasma membranes, organelle membranes, um, they all have to be made. All the enzyme proteins and whatnot, they all have to be made. So biosynthesis is the focus rather than a normal cell is trying, needs to make a lot of ATP. A normal cell is a worker. It's doing a job. It's busy all day doing its job, like the kidney, filtering the blood. That's a job. The liver, running metabolism for the whole body. It's a workhorse for, metabolic workhorse for the body. That's a job. It needs lots of ATP. But the uh, cancer cell just wants to grow, 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 grow and replicate. It's like a you know primitive bacteria. So anyways... Uh, those are some of the key points. So the book, I thought, it was actually quite good on the, the uh, oxidative stress and related reactions and discussion of mitochondria. But overall, I thought the book was kind of boring. You know, I, I've been hearing all this stuff ever since I was 18 years old. Tons and tons of evolutionary theory stuff. So I've kind of heard that stuff backwards and forwards for decades and decades. So I listened to the audio CD version of the book, and then I owned the paperback, and I would just read the interesting parts um, but um, unless you're really interested in evolutionary biology, you'll probably find the book boring. Um, if you want to get his perspectives on oxidative stress, you could buy it in that context or get the Kindle and just look up those parts. Um, but, you know, you just if you just go to YouTube, you could watch a bunch of his videos and his lectures. And that's what he's best on, Krebs cycle and oxidative stress. And those are pretty much the only things I really listen to him about. Um, it, anyways, we'll leave it at that. So if you're interested, there it is. Hope that was helpful.